Amrit Sen. So, Dr. Amrit Sen is a prolific academician from uh, Vishwabharati University, West Bengal, uh, who is a specialist in British Isles literature. Um, he always rejuvenates young minds and produces a lot of scholars and immense power and indomitable intelligence. He enjoys the membership in the Indian Association for Commonwealth Literature and Language Studies and propagates his knowledge uh, via articles, webinars, and seminars. He has authored and edited multiple um, noteworthy critical volumes which cover areas as diverse as Ta Tagore and his circle, Tagore and Environment, Women of Shanti Nigeran, to name just a, uh, just a few. Uh, he has um, guided uh, multiple research uh, in PhD. Uh, so before uh, today's in today's session, he will be uh, dealing with the topic that is role of popular cultural texts as an intermediary art forms. Over to you, sir. We are all ears uh, for your session. Thank you, Shamil, for that very kind introduction. I'm just uh, sharing my screen here so that there's a PowerPoint through which we can interact. Uh, I'd be, of course, uh, speaking for around 40 minutes, and then uh, we can have uh, your questions and your comments because, you know, like every other presentation, this is, uh, this is a work in progress. Right. One or two things uh, I would like to request, Shamil, if you can. Uh, you see, I'm speaking, when I'm speaking, I'm just looking at the screen. So I'm not looking at the messages right away. Uh, and as you will find, I close my eyes as I speak, as I see. So any point that you think I am not audible, you know, please uh, let me know. Or when the, at any point of time, if the presentation vanishes, and if at any point of time you can't reach me, my phone is just by my side so that you can, you know, uh, uh, ring me and let me know that there's a technical glitch because these are things which we need to keep uh, at the back of our minds. Right. Uh, and of course, may I request all uh, the people who are tuning in, thank you very much for uh, your attention, your interest, but please uh, mute yourselves. Right. My subject today is popular culture as an intermediary art form. And when I started off thinking about this, I was initially, you know, sort of thinking about uh, working, uh, about talking about uh, football and uh, popular cultural texts, because football is a sport that Kerala and Bengal both take a great amount of passion in. But then I thought that maybe, you know, it would be a better idea to talk about the historicization of it a bit, because you see, we talk about popular culture all the while without, you know, pausing to think how it came into uh, practice uh, in the West. Of course, I am aware that I am leaving out the historicization of popular culture in India. But uh, because I'm a student of English literature and I teach it, I have worked on it, I thought maybe it was a good idea to you know, think about uh, how popular culture came into being, what its interaction with high culture was, and uh, how you know the word intermediary can come into the focus in uh, this discussion of popular culture. So, popular culture as an intermediary art form, an 18th century perspective. This is the title. Now. Uh, Intermediary, when we use this word, uh, inter, obviously, as you understand, it suggests between, among. And an intermediary, as a noun, is someone who moves back and forth in the middle area between two sides. It's a kind of a go-between, a mediator who shares uh, the route and is a facilitator and in financial terms, very often we use broker and agent as uh, synonymous words. These are what the Merriam-Webster's would uh, lead us to think about the term intermediary. But there's something else which I would like to also bring in, because you know we talk about culture as popular culture as an intermediary art form. But there's another concept which I will introduce slightly later on, and that is from Pierre Bourdieu, 
who talks about cultural intermediaries. And uh, cultural intermediaries, what are they? They are often considered as cornerstone for recent attempts to characterize contemporary cultural entrepreneur as a creative dynamic figure seeking out new practical utopias through experimental combinations of economic and cultural practice. So somebody who stands in between economic and cultural practice within a commodified world of culture and adds a certain economic value to a particular cultural practice. So that's the definition which you'll see at the last. A particular kind of cultural worker in pursuit of both economic and symbolic profit reflecting the interplay inherent in contemporary cultural production between generating new styles of life and protecting established hierarchies of cultural value. So let's take, uh, think of somebody who's very dear to uh, all our hearts, a musician like A.R. Rahman, who would be a cultural intermediary who's functioning between different kinds of music and creating a new uh, sort of packaging of music that will be available for commodified cultural practices, right? Think of the IPL, for example, and the way in which, say, something like uh, <clears throat> the, the, uh, the, the, the sound that you can see, the girls who dance in the st stands are cultural intermediaries who are sort of introducing a new economic practice within a cultural practice, or rather, who are sort of embedding cultural practices within economic perspectives. So this is what Bourdieu talks about cultural intermediaries. Please remember this term because this is something which I will linger on for a moment when I, when I discuss my, uh, my presentation. Now, I will not go into the theory of popular culture. I assume you are aware of the terms which are associated with popular culture. Popular because of its mass appeal, its mass production. Popular because, as Adorno and Hock Horkheimer talks about, it becomes mass-produced repetition of certain prototypes, the culture industry. I am assuming that all of you are aware of this concept of the subculture, the distinction between high culture and low popular culture. Popular in terms because it is uh, inferior in taste and in moral value. These are categories I am assuming this audience is familiar with. And I thank Alex because he's brought together such a diverse group of research scholars, thinkers, faculty members who are aware of these critical terms. Right. Uh, hey, what was the time when these uh, when these practices sort of develop that is something which I would like to linger on for a moment. Now, you see, uh, when I talk about popular culture, and when I talk about the 18th century, remember, this is the time when print culture comes to the forefront in a very, very big way, right? Uh, print culture comes to the forefront in a very, very big way, and cheap print culture becomes available to the audience. You see, this is the moment when culture branches out, when it is available for the people all and sundry. Right? Until and unless, and remember, there's no TV here, all the culture that is available is either something that is folk or something that is available for the first time in a commodified form through print. And therefore, in England, there are territories which develop, which are specifically directed towards producing this variety of culture. And this place is called Grub Street. Where was Grub Street and what was Grub Street? Please remember, the Grub Street was not a street at all. You know, there was no street called Grub Street. Grub Street was a concept, was a space which was associated with popular culture. 
this place was actually on the outskirts of London in a place called Moorfields. Now this place in London is called Fleet Street. This was the resident of prostitutes. This was the resident of, you know, gamblers. This was the resident of cheap printers. And this was the residence of hack writers. Who were hack writers? Hack writers were people who wrote for money and who wrote because you paid them money. So in a sense, they were also literary prostitutes. And you will remember that a lot of forms were developing at this point of time in print. So what were these forms? These forms were forms like autobiographies of criminals. These are called criminal biographies. These were forms like biographies of prostitutes, poor biographies. These were cheap pornography that was being published. Please remember, pornography has always been one of the major areas of popular culture. These were also, very interestingly, news, or what we now know as yellow news, yellow journals. You please remember that when we talk about the post-truth, post-truth is as old as print culture itself, right? Therefore, there was this pamphlet, whole biography, popular biographies, popular criminal literatures. All of this was coming together, almanacs. All of these were being published from this place called Grub Street. Now, therefore, Grub Street became a kind of a binary, a binary to proper taste, a binary to high culture. If high culture was located in the court, if it was located in the high theater houses of London, then Grub Street became the binary associated with popular cheap subculture. It's very interesting because this then generated a cultural conflict, a culture war, as it were. Obviously, popular culture sold, and high culture did not take great pleasure in the fact that it was slowly being displaced by popular culture itself. Therefore, it came out in great antipathy to this uh, concept of popular culture, and through this developed the concept of Grub Street. What was Grub Street? According to Samuel Johnson, who was the cultural uh, guru of the period, the term was originally name of a street, much inhabited by writers of small histories, dictionaries, and temporary poems, whence any mean production was called Grub Street. Now, Grub Street, how did it generate its name? It generated its name from a refuse ditch, a group, a, a kind of a refuse, what we, call, we can call in, in Indian languages as a nala, which ran across this, this entire stretch. And uh, it therefore uh, was a place which was associated with waste. You could see how initially at least popular culture is not an intermediary form. It is something of a complete binary of high culture. This intermediary status would come in slightly later on. And what did it do? Ideologically, it challenged everything that high culture stood for. So if high culture stood for sexual propriety, the whole biography would disturb that. If high culture stood for you know, uh, conservative politics, that popular culture would write spoofs against these uh, ruling people. Therefore, high culture was the authority against which popular culture would continuously engage in a politics of subversion. Right. Therefore, at the initial level, at least, in its representation of Grub Street, Popular culture became a binary that had to be demolished, right? Uh, 
will also notice how popular culture is closely associated, and this I'm sure many of you would agree, with the process of urbanization. You see, every city had its major zone of popular culture. If in England it was Grub Street, then in ba Bengal, for example, in Kolkata, when the print culture sort of ran over Kolkata, there was a place that emerged from where these cheap print books were published, which was called Bottala. Bot, Bot is the banyan. So underneath the banyan tree, as it were, a CD place of Kolkata from which these journals would be published. Right. Therefore, I, I'm sure Kerala too, Kochi, for example, would have its own uh, place from where these CD books would be published. Now, this these might include anything and everything, but it provided a challenge, a counterculture to what was the high culture of the period. Right. Now, uh, obviously, and this was associated with also very interestingly, popular was associated with money commodification of culture from its very inception. And that's what my historical survey would like to lead. You see, what is the USP of popular culture is its commodification and its catering to what the people want to serve the needs and wants of the people. Right. Now, let me put, and since uh, Alex has talked about cultural texts, I'm not just restricting myself to, you know, uh, just to uh, poems or texts like that, but I'd also like to bring in a few pictures. This is the picture of a hack poet writing in Grub Street. It was painted by a very well known painter of that period, William Hogarth. You can see that this on the left, on the left hand side of your uh, panel is, you know, scratching his head and trying to write something for money. The dog and the cat is eating away all the remaining food that is left. The wife is suing while the milkmaid has come to claim his, her bills. So it's a picture of poor writers writing solely, spinning the web as it were, for the sake of money. You see, the metaphors that were used here were the spider and the bee. So high culture is like the bee, which sort of works very hard and produces honey and the spider which continuously produces uh, copious volumes, once again, commodities. Now, in terms of literature, of course, this exploded into one of the texts that many of you read at the undergraduate level, a text called Macfecno, which was written by the poet John Dryden, whom you can see on the picture, against Thomas Shadwell. Remember, both of them were court poets. So it was not that Shadwell was a, was a hack writer. But Dryden cast Shadwell as a hack writer and put him in Grub Street. This is called Poetomachia, War of the Poets. But this became, therefore, not a personal poem, a personal conflict between Dryden and Shadwell, but a conflict between different kinds of culture. And how did MacFlecknoe imagine popular culture? What is the geography of popular culture? Right. So, you see, I've given you a small section of the text where Dryden is creating a history of popular culture. Haywood and Shirley, who were once again inferior poets, dramatists. Now, last great prophet of tautology. So the popular culture is something that repeats itself. Now, this is a concept that Horkheimer and Adorno both talk about how popular culture continuously repeats its stereotypes. So it is inherently tautological. Even I don't of more renown, you see the word dooms becomes very important. Somebody who's a fool, somebody who lacks intelligence, popular culture is often linked with the lack of intelligence, right? Was sent before, but to prepare thy way. Notice the clothing, coarsely clad in Norwich drugget chain, to teach the nations in thy greater name. So popular culture is coarse as opposed to the silk of high culture. Then comes this, you know, representation of the margins of the city. 
close to the walls which fair Augusta bind, Augusta is London here, an ancient fabric raised to inform the site, Barbican at height, of all the pile and empty name remains from its old ruins. You see, notice the metaphors here. Popular culture is associated with brothel houses, prostitution, surrender of values, scenes of lewd loves and polluted joys. An important integral part of popular culture is sexuality. With the vast courts, the mother strumpets keep and undisturbed by watch in silent sleep. Near these, a nursery erects its head where queens are formed and future heroes bred. This refers to the theater of the period. And you can see these infant punks. But notice that popular culture is seen as some a place where great Fletcher, this is the major dramatist of the period, never treads in buskins here, nor greater Ben Jonson, the classical dramatist. So a binary between classical high culture versus popular low culture. You see, at the initial level at least, Popular culture is associated with dun the dunes, foolishness, lack of intelligence, prostitution, pleasure, and repetition. Right. So this is what Dryden categorizes the culture war as. So when we're talking about this conflict, we are actually talking about the 18th century at the right of the beginning of print culture this conflict playing out. So this, of course, a great poem by Pope, published 1726, the Danshiad. Once again, from the Iliad. Iliad is the is a book of heroes. Danshiad is the book of dunces or fools. So, and the Danshiad talks about popular culture as a region of chaos. Lo, thy dread empire chaos is restored. Pope associates popular culture with two things. One is darkness, lack of intelligence, and two, chaos, lack of order, right? So popular culture, according to Pope, is chaotic. You see, once again, linking it with pleasure, because pleasure is chaotic. Right, now let me come to this question of the intermediate, you see, what is the greatest popular cultural form that all of us enjoy? I'm not talking about the film, of course, that was largely uh, modern. It was the novel, right? The novel was that great popular cultural form which legitimized it. But in between the novel and these whole biographies, these utterly popular cultures, popular texts, there rose an intermediary form, written by women, consumed by women, talking about sexuality, bordering on the pornographic, but literal. This was what was called amatory fiction. What was the typical plot of the amatory fiction? It focused on a young woman who came to the town, who tried to explore sexual adventures, had multiple encounters, and finally was either sent to uh, uh, an ashram or a, a nunnery, or she was sent to the country to repent. This was amatory fiction. These are things which very few people of English literature also know. But these were writers, including people like Eliza Haywood, Mary de la Manley, who were looking forward to the novel. These were the mothers of the novel, right? You see, the novel, at least initially, Dr. Johnson pointed out, was a small tale generally of love, right? And notice the popularity. When you talk about the popular, you see a woman in 1710, between 1710 to 1725, was producing 30% of the total I'm sorry, 70% of the total sales during the period. Remember, this is the time when Defoe has already written Robinson Crusoe. This is the time when Swift is publishing Gulliver's Travels. Yet how many of you actually know about even Eliza Haywood? Right. So 
this is that intermediary popular form between the whole biography and the novel as it were. Now, all of you will have to also remember that popular culture, the rise in the, of the history of popular culture was integrally related with the rise of print and literacy. I've given you certain figures there. And very importantly, what were these cultural intermediaries? This is the point which I'm coming back to. These were things like the circulating library. Because you see, if you have to access culture, you have to access books. You had, and books were very costly things at that time. A book would cost almost a week's wages of an average person. So would you eat food or you read novels? Therefore, you had circulating libraries where you could sort of rent these books a day for a penny. So you see, it's not just what of popular culture, but how does popular culture proliferate? You have to keep, all of us have to keep that at the back of our mind, that these are cultural practices, establishments, institutions that become important. For example, have you ever thought how popular culture quickly reached from the city to the country? It was because at these point of times, very importantly, turnpikes and roads started to be built. So Addison's spectator paper, the newspaper of today would reach from London to Newcastle within a day. Earlier, it would have taken a week. So even the building of new roads would be ways through which popular culture would proliferate. And we have to keep this in mind that, you know, we are still talking about pre-industrial society, but we are talking about early modern practices, which make the popular, the popular. Those of you who are great fans of uh, uh, Harry Potter novels would remember, you know, queuing up before the bookstores late at night to read the first issue of uh, the first volume of Harry Potter. But remember, they had to be brought to the shop. They had to reach people all and sundry so that it could become part and parcel. Right. So I've given you certain figures. I won't read out. That would make it very boring. You know, it's interesting that at least in the early part of the proliferation of popular culture, you know, women played a very important part. So there's a sudden gendering of popular culture here also. Right. Women were booksellers, and I've given you the figures there. Uh, and women actually sold pamphlets on the street, so they participated. And these were women who were writing these amatory novels, as it were. Right. <clears throat> now, naturally, when women started writing about sexuality, who would read them? Women, young women. And therefore, what would society look at popular culture? What kind of uh, uh, sort of attitude would society have? It would be very hostile, right? I don't know, I, you know, I am of a different generation, but I remember, you know, when I brought a book written by a very eminent Bengali writer called Buddhadev Bosch, which had a little bit of, you know, uh, spot in it, my father literally slapped me and asked me to return that book to the office library, right? He was very afraid that the book would corrupt now, just think, 18th century society, women writing about sexuality, being read by young girls, it was an extremely hostile response. And therefore, you know, you have the Archbishop of Canterbury, for example, that, you know, and this, this, is, this is one of the holiest of English bishops talking about women being corrupted by reading popular culture. And you see, this is the woman whom I'm, I'm talking about, Eliza Haywood, the novelist, and you can see within the picture even, if you look very carefully at it, you can see those bulging breasts, the cleavage that is being shown. So the writer of popular culture, the writer of these amatory fictions is seen as somebody who is herself extremely sexually promiscuous. And I can't really show you a better picture, but if I would magnify it, there would be syphilic spots on her cheek, black spots which indicated sexual disease. The two major diseases at that point of time would be syphilis and gonorrhea. So even in that characterization, 
this is a frontispiece, of course. <clears throat> Even in that frontispiece, the writer of popular culture, the woman of popular culture, is seen as somebody who is inherently corrupt. And think about this, that in Pope's Dantia, Haywood is pictureized as a woman holding two babes of love by her side, illegitimate children, and in her, is herself the prize in a pissing competition. So who can piss furthest? Between two publishers, Curl and Osborne. And she pissed Haywood as the stupid, infamous, scribbling woman. This is the text that I was talking about, one of her texts. It was called Fantovina, right? A tale of a woman who experiments in the city with various forms of sexuality, right? It's short novel of love. But why do I call this the intermediary cultural form? Because you see, it is from these forms that the novel would be born. Those of you who are students of English literature will remember that we categorized the first English novel as something written by Samuel Richardson in 1740. Haywood is writing in 1725 to 1745, right? So how did the novel, which was popular culture, interact with this intermediary popular form, right? After all, remember that the novel was also something which was mass produced and marketed and read for pleasure. You didn't read the novel merely for instruction. You also read it for pleasure, right? So in 1730, you remember that Haywood was out selling Defoe, Pope and Swift taken together. So she was much more popular. She had to be negated. And Richardson and Fielding were trying to identify Haywood and Manley, threatening rivals to continue to circulate in the market. You see, once again, we are now entering into the other category of popular culture, that it's a mass-produced commodity which is meant for sale, for consumption, right? Therefore, something had to be done so that the amatory fiction could be negated, obliterated, and the novel which was the most popular cultural form of that period, could become a legitimate form. You see, in order for the novel to survive, the novel had to be made legitimate, aesthetically superior, realistically viable, and mimetically coherent. You see, when you talk about, say, a Hindi film where suddenly a dance erupts, you know, it is not mimetically coherent. You and I don't dance in the rain just like that. Realistically viable. Think about it in these terms. One hero, 25 villains. And Salman Khan sort of vanishing and brandishing all of them. Aesthetically superior. You know, this would be probably a Satyajit Ray film versus something which is being directed by somebody like, uh, say, uh, Shekhar Suman. Right. <clears throat> now, once again, another very important role comes in. You see, popular culture very often can be aesthetically chaotic as well, whereas high culture tends to be much more aesthetically coherent. Right. So there was this attempt to somewhere see popular culture as unenlightened, whereas the intermediary culture could proceed towards a legitimate enlightenment culture by itself. Now, how could that happen? Let me talk about Pamela, for example. Pamela was the great cultural event of the 18th century, a novel where the master falls in, of a house, falls in love with a maid called Pamela. Pamela is Sort of, she, he attempts multiple times to rape her. She resists, and she ultimately wins over the master with her virtue, and he marries her. The novel is subtitled "Virtue Rewarded." Right now, think about it. I taught Pamela for quite a number of courses. 
And then I asked one of my students, what is your chief interest in reading Pamela? Do you get morality from it? He said, no, sir. I read it to see whether the rape actually takes place. With a very, you know, sort of unsavory response. But you see, this is what I'm saying is that intermediary form of amatory fiction sort of tried inside out. The sexuality of amatory fiction is forever promised, but always thwarted and then overturned by morality. And this is how you see the novel emerges as that ultimate intermediary form, which takes popular culture and moves towards legitimate high culture. Now take us, you see, if this is Samuel Richardson, then think of somebody like Henry Fielding, the great novel of the 18th century, Tom Jones. Who is Tom Jones? Tom Jones is a bastard whose identity we do not know, who is found in Squire Allworthy's bed, and he's a, he's a ruffian, as it were, he's very generous by heart, but he's always forever indulging in subversive activities. And then finally, he turns out to be Allworthy's nephew. Right. So there is this entire travel of the novel, which experiments with sexuality, which promises promiscuity, and then comes back to the ideologically stable, aesthetically viable. But see how Richardson talks about fielding, you know, his ale houses, his sponging houses, extremely poor morals is indicative of the contemporary response to the novel. So it is, you see, why am I calling the novel intermediate? Because it was struggling. It was struggling between two pulls. One was the pull of popular culture. And the other was the pull of legitimate high culture. Within this, the novel was trying to forge itself. I have, of course, talked to you about the circulating library. You see, and you know how the novel was seen as a cert as a evergreen tree of diabolical knowledge. So the novel is not very comfortable, as it were, in its early years. It is seen as something which is corrupting. It is seen as something which pleases. Therefore, experiments with money and sexuality, and therefore is not a legitimate form that it corrupts young women. Now, of course, uh, once again, Dr. Johnson talks about Fielding's novel, which once again is the tale of a bastard, as something uh, of very low life. He says that if I had not known who Fielding was, Fielding was a magistrate, by the way, then Dr. Johnson says that. I would have believed he was an ostler. Ostler was somebody who looks after horses, right? So you see, the two major novelists of the period, one propelling the novel towards morality, the other more subtly propelling the novel towards pleasure and you know, chaos, carnivalesque. You see, when we talk about the history of the novel, we talk about two forms of culture. One is the prison. The prison which regulates, that is the morality. And we talk about the carnival, the carnival which liberates, and that is sexuality and, uh, you know, the, the movement towards pleasure. So the novel was as it were, and popular culture is always caught in between by its impulse to please and also by its impulse to preserve. You see, most popular cultural forms are extremely conservative in the end, but very liberating as it proceeds. It pleases, but ultimately it falls back within the realm of construction. But very interestingly, this is something which I take from Tom Jones. How did the novelists see the novel? They saw it as the novelist, as it were, as an innkeeper. Notice this. It's a very interesting metaphor. It says, a gentleman who gives a private or elimosy retreat, but rather who keeps a public ordinary. Think about it. When you go to a restaurant, some of you might like idli and dosa. I might plunk for something like a Bengali dish of machet jol, but the innkeeper will have to sub 
will have to prepare everything. He must offer us multiple cuisines. He, can, he must offer us multiple fairs, right? So the novelist also is seen like somebody who has to please, who also has to instruct, who also has to provide experience. So different people <coughs> coming to pop popular culture for different reasons. And the novel is caught in between. Is it popular culture? Is it hype culture? It is this intermediary status that historically the rise of the novel talked about. But remember, the novel was extremely criticized as something which was corrupting. The novel, 18th century novel was at least seen as something which was extremely corrupting. And therefore you see this novel that most beguiles the female heart misreads, she melts, she sighs, and then good night, poor honor. So thousands and thousands of young women, according to the critics, were destroyed because they read novels. Uh, well, now, of course, you don't need novels, but I am sure the younger people out here will remember how their parents scoffed at them watching a web series or, you know, uh, or, you know, in my house, of course, there's some, my young daughter always keeps on watching something like uh, India's Most Wanted or something like that. Any, anyways, I, 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 as somebody who's now a representative of high culture, uh, would uh, tend not to look at it. In fact, uh, you see, there are, there's a continuously a fight going on within my household. Me who would like my Alexa to play Rovindra Shungit, and she would like to play you know, uh, modern Hindi song. So that battle, which took place at that point of time, what, I try, what I'm trying to sort of alert all of you to, is historically, this is a battle which was fought at the very point when cult popular culture was, was created, as it were, modern popular culture, which is commodity uh, oriented, which created this division within taste, right? <clears throat> How did it legitimize, how did the novel come to legitimize popular culture? And for that, I've taken another of Richardson's novels, Clarissa. And he says that, you know, if you look at that second quotation, you can read the first quotation, which talks about morality and Christianity and, uh, and the unworthy characters has been defeated. But he says, because Clarissa talks about, you know, seduction, sexuality a lot. And Richardson alerts us that considerate readers will not enter upon the perusal of the piece only to divert and amuse. So he says, I'll write about sexuality, I'll write about seduction, I'll write about possible you know, rapes, but you don't read that only for amusement. It will probably be thought tedious to dip into it, expecting a light novel or a transitory romance, and look upon story in it as its sole end rather than as a vehicle to instruction. So he says, that you see the novel is not to be read, just to be enjoyed, tasted, for the pleasure of it, for the sexuality part of it, but you have to read it for the instruction. This was the gradual process through which what was the story of love and sexuality was being transformed into a legitimate form of high culture. And this is where I would show you a picture of Henry Fielding. You see, if you take a very careful look at it, Henry Fielding's novels were all projecting him in that magisterial role with that wig of the magistrate. And you can see those two masks there, down there with classical books, the masks of tragedy and comedy. But Fielding was actually practicing a brand of popular culture. But if he had to establish himself as an author, he had to establish himself not merely as a popular author, but the author as a figure of authority of high culture and therefore negate the popular cultural component. So what are my conclusions here? So I have spoken for my sort of quota of 45 minutes. I will now conclude by talking about popular culture historically responding to social churn. And this is, this history, this story that I've talked about the novel is the story of all popular cultural forms, 
right? Responding to social culture journeys, emerging in intermediary social spaces, very often devising themselves as intermediate spaces where cultural concerns are addressed. Of course, you will understand that when I'm talking about modern popular culture, I'm talking about more industrialized, mass commodified spaces. Very importantly, popular cultural forms often emerge as these intermediaries. You have probably talked, uh, younger uh, friends of mine will talk about these uh, reality shows that you now see, right? Now, these did not exist earlier. They came in as intermediate forms where the blurrings, as you will understand, the more postmodern blurring between reality and fiction can be, can be blurred. One of the great you know, popular cultural sites, of course, is something which Baudrillard talks about, Disneyland. Now, when you enter Disneyland, for example, you are actually parking your car in the lot and you are sort of entering a space which is where the boundary between fact and fiction is loose. So once again, popular culture sort of destabilizes, established cultural forms, challenges them, and then in turn becomes legitimate. So what was popular in the 18th century, you read today as the canon. You don't read Henry Fielding as something which was you know, sexual smut. You read that as classical English literature. Now, for example, I'll give you a small example here. One of the great popular forms of literature was detective fiction, right? It was meant to provoke. It was meant to, for, for it was read for delight. Now you have it in your CBCS syllabi right now. It has become part of the canon. So there is, my final point, a fluid interaction between the popular and the high cultural forms. And thereby, you know, culture itself being such a fluid category, the ISIS spaces of intermediates, where you see categories become fluid, forms become fluid, the <laughs> spaces become fluid. Isn't it ironical that the Bortala, which I talked about, the banyan tree underneath, with cheap popular print took place in Kolkata, is now closely associated with the place where some of Kolkata's most important colleges, seats of learning, are located. It is in this intermediary nature of culture that I have placed popular culture, that I've talked about its historicity, I've talked about the moment where <coughs> it exploded in England in the 18th century, and it is a model which you can try and expose to the popular cultural forms that you have been exposed to. It is with that that I would like to conclude my part of the, of the speaking. Now, I would invite you to comment, ask questions, correct me, tell me that I'm wrong, and leave the floor to all of you. Once again, thank you to all the organizers for for providing me with this opportunity of sharing my thoughts with you. Thank you, Dr. Amrit, sir. Uh, now, we, as uh, sir said, we shall move on to the Q&A &Q session. Uh, you can type in your questions in the chat box. From there, we'll be selecting the relevant questions and we'll be addressing that. Uh, and I'll be asking the question to sir and we expect the answers. Uh, sir, we are getting really good feedbacks uh, for the session and uh, the participants are saying that it, it is an insightful lecture. So let's move on to the question. The question is from Shubham Datta. Um, working class characters abound in the 18th century novels. If you kindly give some, some account of their responses to these novels, uh, did they emerge as the target readers of these novels? Yes. Uh, well, thank you, Shubham, for that question. Uh, please remember that when we're talking about the increase in literacy, we're talking about almost a 200% increase in terms of males and 400% in terms of females. 
So we are talking about a whole new class of people who are being introduced to literacy. Right. Earlier, you see, reading public would only refer to the aristocrats and not at all to women because women were not given much education. For the first time, you actually have the same novel being read by a Lydia Languish, who is the lady of the house, and by the mate, who is working in that house itself. So yes, therefore, and it is very important to understand that because these people were now coming into the fold of the readership, reading the novel, they were its consumers. Therefore, they became characters. That is why, you see, the first English novel is about a mate. The second English novel, I would say Joseph Andrews, a major novel, the first of Henry Fielding, is a footman. And you see, by 1749, the bastard, uh, Tom Jones, Tom Jones is the bastard, bastard is a foundling here, by the way, is somebody who has become the protagonist of a novel. So yes, you know, and, and remember that these would these people would be reading a text for pleasure as well as instruction. So a working maid in a household who was very often, you know, coached on by his master would be reading Clarissa to know how to sort of fend off the advances of a master, right? As well as you know, glean pleasure from the novel. So it was a new readership. Therefore, a new class of people were reading it. Therefore, they were being represented within the novel. And therefore, a whole new dynamics of reading was being created. Right. Uh, we'll move on to the next. Are able to hear? Hello. Okay. Am, Am I, I audible? audible? Okay. All right. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we'll move on to the next question. Um, okay. This is a question from Albert Babu. What was the influence of imperialism in Amateur fiction was the popular culture revolving around only with sensationalism like the adultery and sexual desires in the background of palaces. Right. Thank you. That was very interesting. That That is an interesting question in the sense that you are, of course, reminding us that, you know, by 1603, the British East India Company was on its imperial progress. Uh, now, you see, it's interesting in the way in which the woman's body was being gradually sort of uh, created as a paradigm of the colonial space, which could be exploited and therefore, uh, you know, as it were, penetrated in that sense of the term. Now, at the same time, you will also have to remember that with the imperial males came the imperial females, right? So the wives, consorts people who came with the sahibs to these, uh, to these spaces, to these colonial spaces. So a new figure was emerging. For example, let us think of somebody like Mary Wortley Montagu. Mary Wortley Montagu actually went to the Middle East, and she was responsible for bringing the inoculation of smallpox, the practice of inoculation of smallpox, the knowledge of this inoculation, to England. Right. So the there are two things here. One is the body, exploited body of the sexual woman is somewhere a metonymic expression of uh, the of the uh, of the imperial practice of the imperial colonial practice of actually a, a, a process of violation. One. Yet, remember that this was not something which was being done by the woman, by the man, but the woman. Therefore, I can see this also in terms of the metonymic practice of a new kind of colonial subject or the subject of the colonizing subject, rather, the woman who would explore the 
new imperial space, as it were, you know, stretching the frontier of knowledge, as it were. So both these angles could be brought into your question, but that I think was a very, very interesting question. Thank you, sir. Uh, I guess we'll have time for one more question. Uh, I, I, can I take one question which I can see? Because that's a very interesting one which Shibu has, Shibu B has asked, uh, which is uh, uh, which is a major question right now. Is it pertinent, he asked, to talk about the divide between high culture and pop culture at this point in time, and the divide between the two is non-existent? Yes. Uh, you know, yes, uh, to a certain extent, you are talking about this from a postmodern perspective, where these boundaries have become blurred. I referred to, you know, uh, Baudrillard at that one point of time. I happened to teach uh, uh, postmodernism at my department. This is a point that I raise. But you see, while we can talk about postmodernity and the blurring of the boundaries between high and pop culture, I would invite you to, to, you know, to ponder whether these boundaries have actually been, have actually disappeared. Now, you see, uh, as a subject, of course, we have become much more fluid. You know, we are not any longer Dryden who can launch themselves as in a binary against popular culture. But having said that, uh, you know, isn't it true also that there are cultural categories which you exist in, you know, in terms of language, in terms of practice, in terms of literature, in terms of films, music again, where these categories are still there. But what I would like to point out also is, you know, that when you talk about the bloodings, I am suggesting that while the bloodings took place in its earliest hostilities, the historical process ha ha has been one of continuous interactions between the popular and the pop. Right. I will not... I, I will just add a caveat here that I'm talking about a pre-modern period. And that model will, of course, have to be applied with all its caveats in the post-industrial period, where this entire question of mechanical reproduction, Aka, uh, your theorist Walter Benjamin would come in. But these categories still, in a certain, to a certain extent, I think exist and interact. Shall we take one more question, sir? Yes, yes, why not? Okay. This is uh, from a person who hasn't named. Sorry. Okay. This is from a person who hasn't named himself. Can we think at least in early modern period? The popular culture is a kind of challenge against high culture of enlightenment. Uh, yes, to a certain extent, certainly we can talk about. Uh, see, but once again, remember that you know that would be a very very sweeping uh, you know uh, comment, as it were. Say, take a very popular text at that point of time, like uh, Gulliver's Travels. Now, Gulliver's Travels is being written by one of the most, you know, important figures of high culture called Swift, right? Jonathan Swift. Swift is writing something else called a modest proposal. Now, in modest proposal or Gulliver's travel, Swift is actually taking apart the enlightenment. But at the same time, there are cultural, popular cultural texts which are refining the ideas of the enlightenment. Take a text like Tom Jones, for example, which I have talked about to a large extent. You know, there's a lot of sexuality in Tom Jones, but ultimately it is going back to this idea of social order, social stability, the perpetuation of what is, you know, rationality, good nature, allied with understanding. So it is very difficult, you know, there are texts, popular cultural texts, like say uh, these criminal biographies, which, you know, validate the criminal as hero, and therefore challenge the enlightenment structure. And there are these popular cultural texts which seemingly challenge enlightenment, 
but then ultimately revert back to its pillow. So I would not put it in a blanket way that this is leads to A leads to B, but I'd say A can lead to B, but it can also lead to C, right? And that is, I think, very important because popular culture is essentially that the destabilizing quality of popular culture can also get back to the same ideological premises in many ways. I'm sorry, you you have to unmute yourself, Shamil. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, am I audible right now? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. We have a lot of questions coming. Uh, we had a lot of questions, uh, but uh, there are also many observations. Uh, I shall address one. Uh, even in case of Shakespeare, who was by and large a popular theater practitioner, was later institutionalized as an epitome of high culture as an icon of British cultural superiority. Absolutely. And uh, I don't know who's made that comment, but it's absolutely valid. And this actually happened in the 18th century. You see, uh, when the French culture was threatening to overrun English culture, it is at that point of time, you see, that Shakespeare becomes the hero for people like Dryden and Dr. Johnson. Earlier, of course, Dr. Johnson, would, uh, I'm sorry, Ben Johnson would be the the greatest dramatist of his period, while Shakespeare would, you know, dress himself in other people's feathers, as Green pointed out. So, absolutely. Thank you for reminding me that. Thank you. The the observation was from Shubham Datta. Uh, he had previously asked a question, I believe. Yeah. Uh, so now. It's eight o'clock. It's past eight o'clock. We have uh, come to the end of the session. Uh, I would like to thank immensely uh, Dr. Amrit Sensors for such an engaging one hour that you gave uh, with relevant examples of uh, texts uh, ranging from Hogarth's painting to um, Danciad to Pamela. It was, I think all of us could uh, go back to our literature classes and remind and think about all the texts that we learned. So thank you, sir, for spending your valuable time and making us think about it. Uh, and um, we, uh, yeah, a lot of participants are again addressing their gratitude. Um, I and with that uh, we come to the end of the session. Uh, the YouTube link will be provided uh, to the participants later on. Uh, over to you, uh, Russell. Respected Amit sir and Shamil and other participants of the program, I am very fortunate to hear Dr. Amundsen once again within an year. Uh, thank you, sir, for your enlightening words. Uh, you shed a big light into some fruitful knowledge regarding popular culture and its uh, different aspects. So I extend my sincere gratitude for your valuable words and time on the behalf of Binox Webinar Fest. And let me extend a token of gratitude to you, uh, Shamil Francis, the Executive Skill Development Officer in Additional Skill Acquisition Program who has been with us since the inception of this section. Uh, thank you, Shamil, for your vibrant presence here. And uh, let me thank all of you, the spectators of the program. I believe that this section uh, gave you a fruitful knowledge and you made it an alive section. Uh, thank you once again and keep staying with us on next sections. Thank you. Thank you, Russell, for your very kind words. You know, it's been an absolute pleasure meeting you once again and you, to sir, you, you shamil so and to alex who has been uh, sort of engaged with 